Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and happy Saturday. My name is Elon Price. I am the student representative for the executive board, and I am so honored to be here with you as your moderator for this plenary session. So at this time, I would like to give an introduction of our speaker, and then we'll get started with today. Um, I'm super, super excited to give this introduction because I got the pleasure and the uh, opportunity to visit the Flatiron Institute, to visit the Simons Foundation a few years back, and I was really in awe of all the awesome work that's being done there. So our next speaker actually joined the Flatiron Institute in 2016, but he currently serves as the president of the Simons Foundation. How many Simon scholars are in the house right now? Raise your hand, represent, represent. So, yes, yes. I know a few Simon scholars serve on the student council with me and, and I'm always amazed at the work that they've done. And our speaker today, Dr. David Spurgle has been really integral in that program. And so his background uh, is in computational astrophysics, and he has many, many roles, He, including serving as the chair, co-chair of the Wide Field Inter Infrared Survey Telescope, or WFIRST, that you may have heard of. And he also serves as the co-chair of the Global Coordination of Ground and Space Astrophysics Working Group of the International... National Astronomical Union. And even though he's the president now, he served 30 years at Princeton and he's had numerous publications and citations and mentored many, 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 many students and professionals. And so at this time, I am pleased to invite our speaker, Dr. David Spurgle to the stage. Please give a round of applause and stay tuned. What I want to do today is cover actually a couple of different things. I want to talk somewhat about my own journey. Now our mic's not on. Mic's not on. Yeah. Am I on mute? Now my mic's on. Not you know, like so many things in life, not fully under one's own control. Um, and I want to talk a bit about the journey. And what I want to emphasize, and this is really meant particularly for the undergraduates, because I think people who've been at this for a while have definitely know this, that research is not a direct path. It is, you know, sometimes people say it's a marathon, but if you've ever run a marathon, there are people cheering you on all along the way, and you definitely know the path you're supposed to take. It's more like a random run where you have a vague sense you should be going that way and you spend a lot of time in loops and you make mistakes and then you, you know, but the journey itself is exciting and interesting and then you get into an interesting place. And that's what I'm hoping to talk about today. Let's see if we get this slides to advance. There we go. So, so I want to talk about the science and the journey. Having recently read a biography of Einstein in Prague, I want to talk a bit about Einstein's experience in Prague, which was his time when he just got lost. And you never hear about Einstein's work in Prague because he was miserable and got nothing accomplished. And we all, you know, we all have periods like that. I want to talk about my one of my own detours, um, my own my work on topological defects, which was in its way fun and interesting, but ended up being four or five years that I spent working on a project that really, in the long run, went nowhere. But on the end, helped lead to future work, and that future work was measuring the shape of the universe, which I'll talk about, and then. You know, having had a lot these great opportunities, uh, say a bit about some of the things I've been doing recently at the Simons Foundation, where I see our role is really giving back and helping to create the next generation of scholars 
who will do important work and talk about some of the programs and opportunities that we're helping to support. Um, many of which in partnerships with people here who are making these things happen and work. Okay, so I'll begin with my conclusion in terms of the cosmology and what we've learned, I think, over the past 30 years is that our universe is remarkably simple, yet remarkably strange. Uh, our universe can be described by basically five numbers, the age of the universe, the density of atoms, the density of matter, how lumpy the universe is, and how that lumpiness varies with scale. And as you'll see, with those five numbers, we can basically fit all of the astronomical data we have about the large scale structure of the universe in the microwave background. So this is remarkable. It's you know, to me, this is one of the great triumphs of physics. It's what earned Jim Peebles the Nobel Prize a few years ago uh, for his theoretical work underpinning this. Um, and uh, it, it's really amazing how simple the universe turned out to be. I would say that was having worked with the data, that simplicity was the greatest surprise of the, you know, of our work. Um, while, it, but while it's simple, it's remarkably strange. We only know what makes up 5% of the universe, the atoms. We don't know what the dark matter is. All we know is that clusters like atoms, the clusters and galaxies, uh, does not interact much with stuff. It is very weak electromagnetic, nuclear, and even weak interactions. Um, if any, I have no, no interactions at all. Uh, with the, with the normal sector. Um, and then even weirder is dark energy. There is energy associated with empty space. It makes up most of the energy density of the universe and it drives its evolution. And we don't know what it is, right? So, you know, this to me is one of the things that's really exciting about cosmology, particularly its interactions with particle physics. We don't know 95% of the stuff that's out there. But we do know enough to know that whatever it is, it's going to involve new fundamental physics. And that's what motivates so many of us who think about these problems, whether the experimentalists doing underground experiments looking for dark matter, or astronomers, and just heard a nice talk on this, using gravitational lensing to study uh, the distribution of dark matter. Right? All of that is trying to go after that. So how did we get there? Well, this is, I didn't change the location of the slide. It works as well from Tennessee. <laughs> so you're looking out in space. You're looking back in time. You're seeing me not as I was. I am right now. It takes light a few nanoseconds to get from me to you. You see me as I was a few nanoseconds ago. I'm not changing that much. You see the sun as it was eight minutes ago. If you've seen the movie, The Martian, you remember that time lag as it takes to do communications back and forth to Mars. Further out you go in space, the further back you go in time. A star that's 10 light years away, we see as it was 10 years ago. We see the Andromeda galaxy as it was roughly a million years ago. Some of those galaxies you see with the James Webb telescope might be 12 million years old. You're seeing them not as they are now, but as they were 12 million years ago. When we look at the microwave background, which will be the prime subject of my talk, we're seeing the universe as it was 13.8 billion years ago. And so as astronomers, we don't get to do experiment. We get to observe, but we get to observe back in time. The next key idea is general relativity. As Johnny Wheeler said, general relativity could be summarized in, by two ideas. Matter tells space how to curve, and the curvature of space tells matter and radiation how to move. And um, here's, we'll get, get to Einstein in a moment, but here, that was a moment of Einstein's triumph. 
And the key thing as a cosmologist that comes out of this theory is the idea that the universe is expanding. And I think this is something that is the conceptually hardest part of the talk for most of us, and as, as you'll see soon, including Einstein, starts out with a Euclidean notion of space and time. And if you hear the idea that the universe is expanding, the first question you would come up with is, okay, what is it expanding into? And the answer is, to me, it's expanding into the future. The direction of expansion is in time. And as you expand into in, the future, the distances between galaxies grow. So the picture I have of the expanding universe is I, I can't think in four dimensions. I can only think in three dimensions at best. So I suppress one spatial dimension and imagine us living on the surface of a sphere with each galaxy a point on the sphere. And I think about the universe expanding as that sphere getting bigger and bigger, the distance between galaxies growing. And as you think about that expanding sphere, the radial direction in the sphere, its radius, is basically time. To be more precise, it's the expansion factor, but that's just related to time. So you can think about the universe expanding and expanding, getting less and less dense. That means if you run the universe back in time, take that sphere collapsing, getting denser and denser, galaxies getting closer and closer, the radiation that fills the universe, the leftover heat from the Big Bang, getting hotter and hotter. As we get denser and denser, hotter and hotter, eventually it collapses to a, a point in time, right? So the sphere collapses altogether, but not a point in space. The Big Bang didn't happen somewhere. It happened everywhere. Everywhere on that surface of the sphere collapses down to a point. And that's the moment of singularity. Next question is, what was before the Big Bang? We don't know. We're working on it. That's one of the uh, big open questions in, in cosmology, and I would argue one of the big open questions in physics uh, um, is understanding what happens at those enormous densities and temperatures where we need to employ both quantum mechanics and general relativity to understand what's happening. And it is the frontier in fundamental physics to understand what's going on there. So how here's the universe getting hotter in time. Talk about that. I'll, oops. I'm going to skip to Einstein now. Come on. Next slide. How do we get to relativity? So I thought. This is just a, a little fun interlude about the, the journey, motivated somewhat by my having just read Michael Gordon's book, Einstein in Bohemia, um, because this is a part of the story that we often don't talk about. In most talks, people tell you their journey of triumph. In fact, I suspect, you know, spent most of the talks that we heard so far today and this is good. This is what you should do as a speaker. We don't want to hear about all the mistakes you made, how you tried this, it didn't work, it got you there. You tell us what you learned, that you went from here to there. And you listen to people's talks. And I think this is, we get used to the idea that like everything works. Because when you're telling me your story of your, the work you did in the past year, you tell me about the part that worked and what you understood, not this part of the journey. And all of us spend lots of time on this part of the journey. And what I liked about reading about Einstein in Prague, it was that part of the journey for Einstein. It was where he made no progress. And, you know, so Einstein was in Zurich. He was encouraged to apply to a job in Prague. This is 1911. The guy had already done special relativity and the photoelectric effect. Okay, so he's number one on the faculty list for the job. But the minister of education, effectively the university uh, president, said, I have the right to, uh, to switch the ranking 
we're going to make Einstein number two on the job list. You know, this he's doing all this fancy new physics. And I'd rather have an Austrian than a Swiss Jew for the position. So they made the offer to someone else. Fortunately, this other guy who was in, uh, didn't uh, ask for a higher salary. They wouldn't match the salary at his old university. So he turned down the position. They went to their second choice, Albert Einstein. You've never heard of the guy who was turned down, who they made the offer to first. So then Einstein goes to Prague. His wife did not want to go to Prague. She really liked Zurich. Um, there was a possibility of her getting a faculty job at ETH in mathematics. I mean, she had done, you know, uh, you know, Marek had done um, good work in math. She actually played, and this is, I think, an important part of Einstein's intellectual journey. Um, he was always relying on others to help him in mathematics because he was always sort of on the cutting edge and didn't know the tools. She was a key tutor of his for special relativity. And then later in uh, Marcel Grossman would teach him differential geometry. And without Gro Grossman, there is no general relativity because he doesn't, you know, this is something I think we should all learn from is just learning from others, building those, uh, those skills is always stuff we want to learn out there. So um, his wife was hoping to get a job at ETH. Turns out, but do you know when the first woman will get a job in the math department at ETH? September. September 2023. Uh, so they, they've now done it, but it took a while. Uh, she would hate Prague. They're German speaking, the city's mostly Czech, tiny German population. Among the German population, they're Jews. They're really isolated. Um, he meets some interesting people, like a good story that something that almost happened. So Einstein and Kafka were at a part, di dinner party together. They were actually introduced, probably shook hands. Um, Einstein and a few others went out for drinks afterwards. Kafka didn't join them. They never spoke. Right. So it was like good things could have happened. He spent, you know, uh, in 1911, 1912, everyone was working on quantum theory and trying to develop it. That was the big challenge. Gravity was kind of an intellectual backwater. Einstein decided to work on it. Um, he took, in this period, a fully Euclidean approach to developing general relativity. He didn't have an idea of space curving. He, everything he did at this period was filled with mathematical contradictions and inconsistencies. He didn't have the tools to do it. Um, basically, it's not till he returns to Zurich and Grossman teaches him differential geometry that he's able to start to make progress. So, you know, I, I found this remarkable. It was like, I don't know, I, one has this image, you know, Einstein was a credible physicist, right? But like, even Einstein spends time where things don't work or goes in the wrong direction. And, uh, you know, it, it's, and, you know, and Einstein only makes progress with help from friends. And that's, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of us who've been at this for a while know this, but I think for the, you know, young people, particularly for the undergrads, that's just the way we're all going to make progress. Okay, here's my own interlude. So when I was an assistant professor, I got really excited with the idea that the universe, remember, it starts out hot, gets cold. It went through a phase transition. Phase transitions are, of course, things like water forming ice. And if water forms ice quickly, we all know this from the ice cubes in our freezer, 
you get defects in the crystals. Crystallization happens quickly. It's imperfect. Defects form. Those are those air bubbles, basically, in the crystal. To be more precise, if you've got some field theory and the universe is cooling and the, the if it's the right type of transition, the field will settle quickly and it will settle into one place in one position and another place in the other. And you can get these defects and in these cases called cosmic strings or in higher dimensions textures. And I spent a lot of time simulating cosmic strings. Here's microwave background maps. We even wrote a Scientific American article about this. And it made, you know, clear predictions on what we should see. And then after working on this for many years, I went to hear the results from Kobe, the Cosmic Background Explorer, where they made the first maps, the microwave background fluctuations. And Ah, the on switch. That's why I'm a theorist. Um, and when the results came in, it was clear that the signal we predicted was three times larger than what we saw there. And the first time I'm ever quoted, I believe, in the press is I'm quoted saying, we're dead. And basically realized that what I'd spent the previous five years on just was, you know, wasn't done incorrectly. It just wasn't a description of the way our universe worked. And um, this was, you know, 1989. Uh, Four years ago, I had a very distinguished astronomer come up to me and say, why did you waste all that time on it? So sometimes people don't really forgive you. But um, I, I think it was actually the right thing to do. You develop a theory, you see what comes out of it. And But I must admit, at the time, I felt pretty depressed about things not working out. What I did next was I said, Kobe just came out. I'm gonna organize a conference about what Kobe means. And I started to email people and there wasn't any workshops. So I put together a conference and invited people about it. And at it, um, at this meeting, uh, and uh, I liked the guy involved, I'll, I'll tell them. so my, uh, when I was an assistant professor, the guy whose office was next to mine, one of the tenured faculty members, loved to talk. And he would wander into my office and just talk and talk about things like the Olympics. And I was junior faculty, and I was kind of afraid to kick him out of my office. And then at this meeting, he said, this new result proves that the geometry of the universe was flat. And I got annoyed. And I said, how do you know that? I said to myself, because no one's properly worked out what happens in the other cases. And, you know, sometimes we get motivated by brilliant visions. I got motivated because I was annoyed. <laughs> and decided working with Mark Kamienkowski, who was then a postdoc, uh, who had come and we had talked about projects to figure out what would happen to microwave background fluctuations if the geometry was different. And, you know, the in cosmology, the geometry of the universe depends on the density of the universe. If the geometry, the density is large, the geometry is positively curved. If the density of the universe is very low, it's negatively curved. And if it's just right, the geometry that we learned in middle school that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees is valid on the scale of the universe. 
And uh, geometry matters a lot because in general relativity, geometry is destiny. If the density of the universe is large enough, gravitational potential energy wins over kinetic energy and the universe is, collapses in a big crunch. If the density is low, gravity is not important, and that sphere just keeps expanding and expanding, the universe getting lower and lower density, colder and colder. These fates actually inspired Robert Frost to write a poem about some say the world will end in fire, others say in ice. And uh, that was inspired by his learning from Harlow Shapley about the results from general relativity. Uh, and what we realized was that if we looked at the microwave background, that there would be a, the size of these hot and cold spots that we see in the microwave background are basically determined by the geometry of the universe. The basic physics is that you know when you have a dense region, you create a region of high pressure, it sends out a sound wave. That sound wave moves a characteristic distance in the 380,000 years uh, before electrons and protons combine to make hydrogen and the plasma stops behaving, it stops, is no longer coupled to the photons. So nature is holding out a ruler. And when you have a ruler, the angle depends on the underlying geometry. The angle is smaller if the universe is positively curved. Get our traditional 180 degrees in a flat universe. And if it's negatively curved, we would we realize it would predict a smaller angle. And this implied that if we could measure the size of the hot and cold spots, we would be able to measure the geometry of the universe. And that actually uh, led to a conversation where my colleague Lyman Page, who was an experimentalist, um, asked me to join a NASA proposal. And he said, we talked with our experimental colleagues and we decided to invite you in for two reasons. One, we made this clear prediction. And the other was that I was honest enough to say we're dead, which made a big impression on the people from the Kobe team that a theorist was actually willing to admit that the results completely ruled out their model. Now, it wasn't that hard to do because it was really dead. <laughs> So we worked and then launched, led by a, a team, Dave Wilkinson, who passed away just after we got our first data. NASA let us rename the mission after him. Um, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotri probe, we launched it out to five times the distance to the moon and made a detailed map of the microwave background. And this is what the map looks like at all these different frequencies. And my favorite thing to look at the map, and I first noticed this when Stephen Hawking was giving a talk. So if you look carefully, there's his initials right there. And that's really in the data. And I was really sitting in the back of the room with his talking about our data with, and noticed it for the first time. And um, that mostly shows you that our eyes are really good at finding patterns, whether they are statistically significant or not. Um, Stephen Hawking was a great physicist. Uh, his initials are not written <laughs> on the sky 13.8 billion years ago. So this is just another image, really a more detailed physical construction of what's going on. Remember, I told you we have regions of pressure that gen out, set, generate out sound waves. You can see that the dark matter doesn't move. It generates a deep potential well that generates a cold spot. The electrons, photons, and protons do move out in a sound wave. And this leads to a characteristic pattern when you sum over all those different waves. 
And that means when I go and I take the, the data that we got, those maps you saw, um, and this is actually work done with more recent data from the Planck satellite. Um, if you stack on a cold spot, you find a hot ring around it. If you stack on a hot spot, you find a cold ring around it. That distance here is that ruler that nature is holding up. Right there, you've got a measure of the geometry of the universe. The depth of that cold spot is set by how much dark matter you have. The amplitude of the ring set by the amount of electrons and protons you have. So by I, you can read out the ratio of ordinary matter to dark matter. And then the thickness of the ring depends on photon diffusion relative to the electrons. So that gives you a very accurate measurement of the density of baryons in the universe. And then the number of hot and cold spots and their amplitude versus scale gives you a measure of um, the amplitude of fluctuations of the function of scale. And that's why when we get to look at these maps, we can, and see those sound waves, Let's go back to the maps, those maps have encoded on them the basic parameters of the universe from looking at it, from interpreting those sound waves. And those same sound waves produce patterns in the galaxy fluctuations. You see these sound waves in observations of large scale structure. So this represented the data that we had from that experiment. The points are, were the measurements from WMAP, this from various ground-based experiments, and um, the red lines of theory, and they gave us the basic numbers that we want to measure. And the progress, not only do we see that, the fluctuations turned out to be remarkably sim simple. The, when we look at the pattern in the maps, they were well characterized by Gaussian initial conditions, that the amplitude of the, those fluctuations are a Gaussian field with no other higher moments. And you can see here the distribution of temperature with different smoothing scales, uh, four degrees, one degree, and a quarter degree. And once you've normalized by the variance, there actually are no free parameters here. It's just plotting a Gaussian versus the histogram. So the early universe turns out to be incredibly simple. Gaussian random fluctuations. And once you've got those initial conditions, you can run this forward and compare simulations of these con initial conditions with observations of large-scale structure and the large-scale distribution of matter. And we can basically fix all the parameters from observations of the microwave background and then run things in forward in time to compare with results from surveys like Sloan or now DESI and soon uh, Rubin. And with that, infer what's going on with things like dark energy and dark matter. And the microwave background observations, it becomes so basically the foundation on which we can use to compare our observations of galaxies and dark matter today and learn more about the evolution and nature of the universe. So let me go forward in time. So I've already mentioned Kobe, which killed us. That killed my, my topological defects, those observations. Then I got to work on WMAP. And a decade later, the European Space Agency launched Planck. And these are the same regions you can see the ever improving data. And here's the Planck map of the sky. Planck now measured at nine frequencies. And this now shows the measurements from WMAP in blue. The kind of progress you see when you have the Planck measurements here, though the same parameters, the same model keeps fitting the data. And here's measurements from the ground, from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, and from the South Pole Telescope. What I am not allowed to show you yet is we have new measurements from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope that we hope to release within the next three to six months that look even better. So we continue to kind of improve um, the work we did in Chile was here up in the desert. 
This is a telescope being constructed. And we can go, with this, this is the same region of the sky observed with Planck, which remember was a big step beyond Colby and W map. And now we can map things at even higher precision. And when you go to even higher precision, not only do you see these bright radio sources from quasars, but you see lots of these blue cold spots. And each of those blue cold spots is a cluster of galaxies casting a shadow against the microwave sky. And we've now identified um, thousands of clusters in a mass selected sample by the shadows they cast. And through making measurements of things like gravitational lensing, we have measured the integrated distribution of mass, electron pressure, and electromomentum across the universe. And this lets us characterize the growth of structure. So, since I wanted to talk about my journey, having moved on in that journey and um, so I'll tell you uh, a key personal point in this. About 13 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. And it's a good story, 13 years ago means a treated, completely cured. But it, when that happened, it was, well, well, you know, I thought, you know, you sit back and you say, what happens if I die, right? What's going to happen? And like, I realized my two older kids were old enough. They were far enough along. They do fine. My younger son would, would really affect his development. Um, and I also thought about the projects I was doing and things I was leading. And I realized, you know, if I, Joanna Dunkley, who was leading the analysis for with working with ACT, she would take over ACT. And my former student, Ichiro Komatsu, who is now a Max Planck director, could take over WMAP. And Princeton University, where I was department chair, they would find someone else. They would do fine without me. Princeton's probably going to be around. Um, and uh, then when I recovered, I said, okay, if, I, you know, all those things could happen without me, why am I doing them? And sort of turned over leadership of all those different projects to others and what decided now is the time to do new things. And that's when first scientifically, I decided to help launch what's now the Roman Space Telescope, then W first and get that project going. And then later when Jim Simons and Marilyn Simons invited me to come to New York to talk about building the Center for Computational Astrophysics, I said, felt I was ready to do something new and build something new. And it was exciting to be part of building the Flatiron Institute and creating something that um, I think some of you have had the pleasure of you know, coming in and working with us and it's been great. We want to continue and to, to do that. And, um, you know, Sir Rodney Johnson is here, okay, was the, came with me and helped, uh, you know, we helped build that together and create that. And then um, about two years ago, uh, Jim, well, actually about three years ago, I started two years ago, they asked me before, it wasn't start tomorrow. Um, I came into Jim and Marilyn Simon's office and they said that they wanted to step back from running the foundation. And would I become a foundation president? And this has been a really exciting adventure. I've basically spent my career as a specialist. You kind of heard, you basically just heard what I did with my career, right? Study cosmology and know a lot about it. And now I'm a generalist. So now I, you know, we'll, we support work in neuroscience. We support work in uh, autism, in biology, in mathematics. 
Uh, we do things from the high school level on up. We have a theater, we have a film program. And I'm now responsible for making decisions on all of them. I like to joke I'm uh, the least informed person in the room on every topic, which is why I get to decide. That's how leadership positions work. Um, you know, but one of the things that's made me think about is like, what are we aiming to do? We're aiming, our role is to support basic science and mathematics. That's our, our mission. And, you know, great science transforms our understanding. And our goal is to provide support to scientists whose, whose work might lead to breakthroughs. And that's why I'm here. That's why we're supporting a lot of the programs that you're involved with, is to help support the next generation of scientists who will lead to those breakthroughs. And um, you know, one of the things I think about, actually in any project, and this came from my postdoctoral mentor, John Bacall. John had a sign over his door. It's a quote from Hans Bethe. Only work on projects where you have an unfair advantage. And, you know, I think of this now, not just with people, but of institutions, right? Your University of Tennessee, what's your unfair advantage over most places? Oak Ridge is down the road, right? And that's an amazing place. And that the fact that you're interacting with that puts you in a special position. You know, when we set up Flatiron, I felt one of our unfair advantages was being in New York City. And lots of people like going through New York City. We were close to other institutions, NYU and Princeton and, and Columbia and CUNY and Rutgers, and we would be able, Stony Brook, we'd be able to work with all those places, which we do. Um, and as individuals, if you come, I think often you can get an unfair advantage is if you come into a field knowing things that other people don't know. Uh, having friends who know in other fields who can give you perspectives, bringing in new tools. Uh, you know, uh, if you're, sometimes the advantage is one where it's like, all right, you're studying, you got interested in studying early galaxies. People before you didn't have James Webb. You get to use James Webb. That means there's a whole bunch of things that you could do that no one before you could do. And recognizing those moments, I think, is really important. So in the foundation, what, you know, as a foundation, what do we get to do? We get to make some long-term investments. We get to make take some risks. We can make mistakes. Um, and... Uh, we have this emphasis on basic science and math, and we can really work across boundaries. Um, you know, uh, at the moment, an advantage we have um, in you know this terrible Supreme Court decision, we can work around it much more easily than most places because we're a private foundation. So you know, when you see you can do things like that, you you do them. Um, and you know, our goal is really supporting transformative science. And uh, I think, as I think about all the things we do, and this is some gives you some range of things from work on stellarators uh, to some of the student program research programs we support to Quantum Magazine and Sandbox Films, where we support. You know, we can take risks and do things and communicate our excitement about science and try to capture the imagination of people out there. And for me, a really important thing for advancing science is building linkages. And I think if you look at um, what we try to do, things, whether it's our the collaborations we support or Flatiron Institute, or those of you who are part of our intern summer programs. And I think what's important about a meeting like this is building linkages and connections. And I think you see, a, um, if you look at the kind of history of how science advances, linkages and connections are a really important metric. And, you know, this is something I, uh, 
encourage all of you to do here, especially people who are here for the first time, it's a chance to build these linkage, linkages and connections and build networks and talk to people and learn what's going on in other areas. Another thing we do is a lot of is we try to build tools that enable science. And uh, for this community, perhaps the most important one is we support the archive, which has been, I think, an essential communication tool. And then finally turning to you know, what we're trying to do with our diversity strategy. And we want to just bring in excellent people to do transformative science. And that's, you know, uh, it, and this is why we're sort of targeting increasing representation from underrepresented groups, because there's just a lot of excellence that we want to bring in and enable people to do great things. And that's, that's really what we're striving for in our programs. And, you know, right now, and uh, just mention some of the things that we're, supporting because I know there are people involved with different pieces of it. And uh, this is the uh, paid advertising part of the talk where I want to sort of give a shout out to some of these programs just for people who are interested to go talk to people about them. Um, you know, a lot, the team up report, and we have some people from that team was very influential in shaping the strategies that we developed and we are uh, supporting that effort. And, um, and encouraging other institutions and foundations to support what's going on there. We've been a long time supporter of high school activities around Math for America. Um, really pleased to see some of our folks from Stony Brook. Um, this is the first year a class of our Stony Brook program. You know, this is inspired by the longstanding Meyerhoff program and is, um, you know, I'll just say how pleased I am with uh, just the terrific students uh, that have, are starting off the program. And I think they're gonna uh, really set the bar for excellence and for building a community that, you know, we hope will be growing and thriving for the, the long term. And so looking forward to seeing all the great things they'll be doing. We've been supporting the National Gem Consortium. Um, we've uh, now supporting of uh, faculty programs at Spelman and Hampton, uh, the Hampton one we just announced. Um, for a while, we now have the, uh, the Simons <clears throat> NSBP Scholars Program. And uh, it was a real pleasure getting to sit in the back and hear some talks by and, and see some of our scholars, you know, doing really great things and presenting some of the results here. And uh, we're, this is a program that involves doing research, both with either with Simon's Observatory um, or at the Flatiron Institute. And particularly for uh, students who are, are, well, if you are a junior or if you know people who are juniors and will be rising seniors this coming summer, um, I wanna encourage you to apply for this program. And if you're, a uh, rising freshman, rising sophomore, or rising junior, we sometimes take you guys too. So also apply. And I think this is a great opportunity to get involved in research. Um, we're supporting the CUNY Masters in Astrophysics program. Um, I am actually a big believer in, in master's programs as a way to give people stronger backgrounds, but, uh, heading into graduate school. Um, the astrophysics program is one that we're very excited about, um, but I actually view it as a model that we're hoping to see expand to other areas of, of math and science, where uh, masters are not pay to play, right? Which is the problem with most programs that, you know, uh, uh, you know PhD programs are usually funded for, masters you have to pay for if it's just a master's program. Here we're funding you to go and you're supporting. And you can learn more about that program. And then uh, our supporting of the, the team up effort. And these are uh, some of the things we're doing. And I am really excited about these things. And it's been, it's great to see some of the members of these programs here and kind of looking forward to seeing the great things you're doing and the great things you will do. And, uh, 
as you do them, and this is for all of us, I think uh, I, what, I was ho what I hope you took away from my talk is both I hope a sense of excitement about some of the science we do in cosmology, but also a sense of what the journey is like sometimes. And that we all you know, need to be reminded that on the journey of doing science, there's gonna be good days, and then there'll be years in Prague. Okay, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Spurgle. So unfortunately at this time, we won't have time for questions, but so we're gonna proceed with the next part of our uh, uh, plenary today, but I just want to say, can we get one more roaring la round of applause for Dr. Spurgel? That was an awesome talk. And I'll be around today and tomorrow, and am happy. You know, grab me if there's something you want to talk about. So thanks so much. So just a few quick announcements, um, some housekeeping. So um, we have a picture scheduled to be taken at 1.30. Yes. Um, and so we will need everyone to head over to Aris Hall. Joseph A. Johnson, what's the day? Because Charles and his wife. What went over there? OK. Um, and if we could get everyone just to wait for about five minutes, we do have a very important announcement. It's the Joseph Johnson Award. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So one of the awards that we give out at NSBP in, in combination with the American Institute of Physics is the Joseph A. Johnson uh, Award. And this year's Joseph A. Johnson Award is going to Dr. Charles Brown II. So Dr. Brown grew up in Las Vegas. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Minnesota and earned his PhD from Yale University where he is currently an assistant professor. His groundbreaking research experimentally explores the nature of matter through the behavior of ultra cold atoms moving through grids of light. But his contributions to physics extend far beyond the laboratory. Dr. Brown co-organized the annual Black in Physics Week, which started in October 2020 to increase the visibility of Black physicists and their scientific achievements. Please come to the stage. Please come to the stage, Dr. Brown. Okay, well, uh, mm. I'll, I'll try to make it quick. I think it'll be about two minutes. I did write some things, but I don't want to take up too much time. Um, <clears throat> uh, so first, uh, thank you to NSBP and to the American Institute of Physics for the recognition. And of course, since she's here, uh, thank you to my incredible wife, Dr. Lindsay McMillan Brown. Uh, <laughs> without whom I could not have accomplished as much as I have. Uh, so let me get into what I wrote. Uh, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which the uh, flower grows, uh, not the flower. This is a quote from Alexander Den, Den Heyer. Um, as a physicist, part of my life's work will involve solving mysteries that describe how our universe functions in its many capacities. 
Another part of that work involves engaging the public and you all in a variety of ways. After all, science is a wonderful and cultural human endeavor, which not only affects its practitioners, but also the greater society in which we all live. It's thus important for us as scientists to actively inform and engage the public about our work, particularly in ways that relate to the improvement of everyone's quality of life and the protection of that life, be that an, an, an improvement in one's safety and health, socioeconomic mobility, or one's sense of belonging to something important through the camaraderie and deep satisfaction of discovery. Uh, in so doing, it's crucial that we ensure everyone willing and able to participate in the human cultural endeavor that is science is offered the opportunities to do so and to actively fight notions that science is for or done only by a select few. I'm almost done. Uh, I'm deeply honored to receive the Joseph A. Johnson Award for Excellence, especially given our shared experiences um, as Yale Physics PhD graduates. Professor Johnson was an academic leader who was impactful in scientific research on turbulent plasmas uh, and the lives of students that he mentored and through the organizations that he was instrumental in founding, such as NSVP, the big institute at the ICTP in Trest. Uh, that his namesake carries an award for excellence is fitting for him. And I'm moved by the idea that I'm carrying on the legacy of an important, a historically important physicist like Professor Johnson. So thank you. Now, um, now there are honorable mentions. Um, the, uh, Dr. Dante O'Hara and Dr. Danielle Speller. Are either one of you here? So please come on up. Now, Thomas, we can take your picture and stuff. You don't have to give a speech, though, if you don't have one with yours. Okay. Okay, and some final housekeeping. So at 1.30, we have the NSBP photo, the annual photo. Uh, this will be at Eris. Yes, yes, but by 1.30. Yes, okay, immediately after this session. Willie wants everyone to get over there now. So those of you who can walk, um, if you go past the information desk and continue outside the building, there's Eris Hall. Anyone who has mobility issues will need to go in the other direction and we'll have vans. I also wanted to announce that immediately after the, uh, after the picture, which is also very important, we did not forget about lunch. So you will pick up your lunch immediately after taking the picture. And that's probably why Willie wants you to get over there to take it now. Um, so that you can pick your lunch up afterwards. The rest of the sessions, we still have scientific sessions and a number of great panels and poster sessions will be at the convention center. So after you, you leave Eris Hall, you will collect your lunch on the way back to the convention center. Those of you who are presenting posters, there is a poster session. Everybody's welcome to check out the poster session, but we do have workshops going concurrently. So please make sure if you're not presenting the poster that you take the time to check out the exhibitors and the concurrent workshop. Thank you so much. <laughs>